Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. All right, welcome back to NucleCast. We are, of course, the podcast of the Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance Deterrence Center, where we discuss topics that span the breadth of all things nuclear and nuclear modernization. Now, today we are honored to have Bruce Klingman, who specializes in Korean and Japanese affairs as the Senior Research Fellow for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation Asian Studies Center. Now, Bruce has been looking at North Korea for more than 20 years and is a former CIA and DIA analyst. So with that, Bruce, I want to bring you in and uh, just say thanks for speaking with us today. And, you know, we did a book where you wrote a chapter in 2020. Of course, that book is Guide to Nuclear Deterrence in the Age of Great Power Competition. And as an expert in North Korea, uh, you wrote a really great chapter that gave our readers the opportunity to better understand what the challenges are in North Korea and what the threat is uh, to this nation. And, and in some respects, uh, what North Korea and its leader Kim Jong-un are up to. So with that, let me just begin the show by asking you, what do you think the motivations and the rationale are? Because this is something that many folks wonder, like they, they sit and they wonder, why is North Korea doing what North Korea is doing? To what end? So perhaps you could uh, start off, start us off by giving us a clue as to what's in the minds of North Korea's leaders. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me, and as well as the opportunity to to work with the uh, with all of you on the on the book last year. Uh, uh, it really helped coalesce a lot of uh, thoughts I'd had on the sort of North Korean nuclear and missile programs. Uh, we often wonder. Why did North Korea do something either on a tactical basis? Why did they do something today? Or strategically, why are they doing a certain program or a certain policy? Uh, and, and we often debate amongst ourselves, among the, amongst the Korea Watcher community. Uh, but you know, they've been pursuing nuclear weapons since the 1960s, uh, and then the missile means to deliver them. And they also have conventional uh, warhead missiles. So they, they serve a number of purposes. You know, they would say it's all a response to what they call the U.S. hostile policy. Now, we would say, well, North Korea is the one that has repeatedly attacked the U.S. and, and South Korea over the years, acts of war, acts of terror, et cetera. Uh, you know, so we would point to them as having the hostile policy, but it's a way for them to, to justify their programs. You know, it even serves sort of political or, or diplomatic objectives for having uh, viable nuclear missile programs. It's uh, leadership legitimacy. The, the previous leaders, the, the grandfather and the father of the current leader, you know, their credentials were based on the fact that the oldest one sort of, in their view, almost single-handedly defeated the Japanese uh, you know, occupation of the peninsula in World War II. Uh, and then the, the father, you know, he really... Uh, you know, was the, the son of the, the, grand, the grandfather and, and sort of made his bones with the military programs. And, and the, the, the third one, the leader, the, the grandson, you know, his legitimacy is kind of based on maintaining the policies of his father and grandfather, including nuclear weapons. And, and he seems to even more closely embrace the programs uh, than his predecessors. He's, he's often pr present at the demonstrations of new missile systems. So uh, you know, it's a legitimacy for him, and it's also a, a source of pride for the North Korean government and people that this little country can stand up to the big bad, you know, United States by developing these programs, even as the world is trying to pressure them to give them up. Now, do you see the actions of North Korea as being shaped, controlled, influenced by uh, the PRC, the People's Republic of China? Or do you see them largely acting autonomously for their, their own interests? It's really autonomously. Uh, you know, people think of you know, China, which is an ally of North Korea. They fought with North Korea in the Korean War. Uh, if it hadn't been for Chinese intervention, North Korea would have been overrun by UN forces after the North invaded South Korea. Uh, and people look at you know, the very large superpower of, of China and tiny little 
North Korea, a country of 55 million people or so. And they think that North Korea can't possibly either do things on its own, accomplish military developments, uh, or it really has no will of its own. It must be doing Beijing's bidding. Uh, but really, that goes against 5,000 years of Korean history. Uh, a common Korean adage in both North and South Korea is that Korea is a shrimp amongst whales. They see themselves as a tiny nation, whether it's unified or, or divided, uh, surrounded by big powers, uh, China and, and uh, Japan. And they, they've been overrun or invaded, oh, a thousand times or so during their, their thousand year history. So they, they are very nervous about large neighbors. And now they point to the United States as a, as a great hostile power. Uh, so even during the heyday of North Korean Chinese relations under the grandfather Kim Il-sung during the 1950s and 60s, uh, North Korea was able to play off both the Soviet Union and China against each other so that neither really had a lot of influence over North Korea. Yes, China accounts for 90% or more of North Korea's foreign trade, uh, but China is very hesitant to do things like pressure North Korea. Now, obviously, they're acting like North Korea's lawyer at the UN Security Council, uh, but they're very reluctant to take action against North Korea to pressure them. So uh, even the development of North Korea's nuclear and missile programs are largely indigenous. They get stuff from the outside world, uh, but it's on their own. And it's because they don't trust the Soviet Union or Russia and China to do what they want them to do. Now, I was in uh, Seoul a couple of years ago, and one of the things that I was told by the military uh, officer I was working with was that there's an old adage that the borrower is slave to the lender. But if you borrow enough, the lender becomes slave to the borrower. And that North Korea now has China in the position where they can act in ways that China does not like, but because China does not want the mess that a collapsed North Korea would become, they therefore can push around uh, China in ways that they would not otherwise be able to. Is, is, is that really what's going on? Or is it you know somewhere in between? Or what exactly is it? Actually, that's, that's very good. I may steal that analogy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of the reverse of, you know, when people talk about a, a bank being too big to fail and so the government bails it out, uh, you know, North Korea is, oh, I don't know, too unpredictable or too dangerous to fail. So, you know, you can think of it like, you know, think of a, you know, a, a criminal pointing a gun at you and saying, give me what I want or I'm going to do something dangerous. Also, there's that fear that China has of a North Korean collapse. So think of this, the the, the criminal putting a second gun to his own head saying, give me what I want or so I'm going to do something bad. So if the regime collapses, then who has control of the nuclear weapons? A uh, very dangerous situation right on China's borders. Uh, you know, if for us, the best case is it collapses quietly and then they invite the South and the U.S. to come up and take over. Well, then China has just lost you know, a, a close ally. It loses a lot of prestige. If it can't even keep North Korea afloat, why should other nations be nervous about it? Um, so it, it really is a question of who has who over the barrel. So yes, China is huge. It controls 90 some percent of the North Korean foreign trade, but they're very afraid of an explosion or an implosion if they turn the screws too tightly on North Korea, either explosion of an invasion, an attack, a very provocative action, uh, or an implosion of regime collapse, loss of control of nuclear weapons. So, you know, on aid and, and sweetheart economic deals, China will sort of, in essence, write a big enough check each year to keep North Korea afloat. They don't want to have them too comfortable. They're hoping North Korea will reform uh, so that its economy improves, but they're really afraid of doing anything too tight you know, or too strong on, against North Korea. Now we're gonna take a break. And when we come back from that break, what I'm really curious to know is about the actual nuclear weapons program of North Korea. Now I was writing about North Korea probably four years ago, and I'm absolutely certain that in the last four years, we've had a lot of change 
And so when we come back, I'll ask you to describe where we are and of course, where we're going and to what end. This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the Anwar Deterrent Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. All right, and welcome back uh, from the break. And so, Bruce, uh, before the break, I had asked you to think about where we've gone over the last few years in terms of the North Korean nuclear weapons program. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Where are we? Well, unfortunately, we're in a very bad spot. Uh, One thing I've noticed in the 28 years I've been looking at North Korea is there's a a tendency oftentimes to either minimize North Korea's capabilities, or just simply not believe that such a tiny little country could possibly develop things or develop them on their own. Uh, and, and we've been surprised for those who downgrade it. Uh, so in the 1990s, uh, even parts of the U.S. intelligence community were saying, ah, North Korea couldn't possibly have plutonium for nuclear weapons. Uh, in the George W. Bush era, it was, well, this uranium nuclear program uh, as a parallel program, that's just George Bush's imagination or fi- you know, figment of his imagination or justification for tough actions. Uh, then when Israel bombed a uh, nuclear reactor in Syria in 2007, which was being built with North Korean help, North Korean personnel, you know, oh, that that's, couldn't possibly be a reactor. It's just a, a missile storage site. North Korea's cyber capabilities, hydrogen bomb capabilities, ability to hit the United States with with intercontinental ballistic missiles, all of those were dismissed until you could no longer dismiss the evidence. So, you know, without going into nomenclature and ranges and stuff, you know, North Korea right now has missiles that can hit every range and they have nuclear weapons. Uh, Some will debate, oh, they haven't proved this capability or that capability. Well, they have the capabilities. Uh, it's really hard to get an estimate of the number of nuclear weapons. Even when I was at CIA, we made a series of educated guesses. Uh, In 2017, there were some leaked U.S. intelligence documents, which indicated the the intelligence community thought North Korea had 30 to 60 nuclear weapons or fissile material for that number. And the capability of producing 7 to 12 weapons worth of fissile material every year since then. So if you extrapolated, so they could be getting close to almost 100 nuclear weapons or weapons worth of material. Um, you know, and then uh, on missiles, in 2017, they did three ICBM launches. They showed that they could range all, all the way down to Florida and beyond with intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, just this past October, they displayed, or in a parade, an even larger ICBM, and they don't need bigger range, so we think it's to carry multiple warheads. And they also uh, showed that they can indigenously produce these 11 axle huge mobile launchers uh, for the ICBMs. And the danger there is that with more warheads on missiles that more of them can go out in the field because they can make the launchers, it could overwhelm the limited number of interceptors that we have based in the continental US. And then on the lower ranges, they've got missiles that can hit our U.S. bases in, in Guam. They've got missiles that can hit all of Japan and South Korea and our U.S. forces there. So uh, short, medium, intermediate, intercontinental range, they've got missiles and all those ranges can be inter, uh, nuclear capable. Now, that leads to the follow on question, which is to what end is North Korea developing this capability? Well, I've, I've recently completed a study on North Korea's nuclear strategy. And you know, what I found was that uh, the strategy and the doctrine drove the development of the weapon systems. And then as they made those improvements, they in turn altered the nuclear doctrine to new objectives. So at first it may have been, they just wanted to have a few in order to deter the US, even though we had never attacked them when they didn't have nuclear weapons. 
Uh, and then as they develop more and more in the different uh, delivery capabilities, uh, you know, it's raised the, the concern that, you know, they now have a, a second strike capability, perhaps moving to a first strike capability, uh, especially with these more and more of the missile solid fuel, mobile, harder to target. Uh, and are they moving towards an actual war fighting capability? Uh, now, they continue to have as their doctrine unification of the Korean Peninsula on their terms. Now, we don't think they're going to just wake up and, and attack. And I think we're more concerned of either an escalation of a tactical situation, which perhaps inadvertently goes nuclear, or sort of stumbling into a nuclear war, where uh, especially because they have such poor reconnaissance capabilities, might they might misinterpret U.S. and South Korean signals that we're doing something for deterrence. They might see that as a, a prelude to an actual attack. And for example, in 2017, when President Trump was talking about a preventive attack to prevent them from completing their ICBM program, um, and some senior officials were saying we could hit two or three targets in North Korea, and North Korea would never respond. Well, they would have. And would they have misinterpreted even a limited two or three target attack as the precursor to an all out massive strategic attack? And then they launch everything they've got. So, it can be a very worrisome situation given their growing capabilities. Now, as you think about the strategic environment in which North Korea finds itself, and you know, going back to the you know the invasion of Iraq and then in the Iranian nuclear program, you know, for example, with Iran, you could understand why the Iranians would say, "Hey, the Americans invaded the country to the north of me." They invaded the country to the west of me. I could potentially be next. And so, therefore, nuclear weapons have historically proven to be a capability that discourages American adventurism. Would you say that the North Koreans largely see nuclear weapons as, as a deterrent for that? Or would you say that they see it as also having utility in? broader coercion and trying to, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, they're one of the, the most, uh, you know, aggressive criminal states when it comes to counterfeiting U.S. dollars, hacking, you know, they do it for profit. They do all sorts of things. And do they sort of use that nuclear umbrella to enable all of these other activities or is it largely America don't invade us? I'd say all of the above. Uh, certainly they depict it as a deterrent. And they frequently will say, I mean, after they stopped pretending they didn't have nuclear weapons and denying them, uh, when they did say, yeah, we, we, we've had them for a while, you know, they always depict it as a deterrent. Now, they also have a number of statements of preemption. They will preempt our preemption uh, or a perceived U.S. Uh, you know, impending attack. Uh, and they'll say, yeah, you know, they will do that either if they feel that forces are going to come up from South Korea or the U.S. is about to do, you know, a decapitation attack on the leader. Um, so they have said they will preemptively use nuclear weapons uh, in a defensive way, as, as they put it. Um, but, you know, again, when the U.S. has not never attacked them, except in response to a North Korean action, why would they need those nuclear weapons. They've got a million man army. It's forward deployed near the DMZ. They've got 10,000 artillery systems, you know, that without moving further south can hit South Korea with, you know, hundreds of thousands of shells in an hour. Um, but they've developed it. And as they develop more and more and more, that raises the concern of like, well, how many do they need just for a deterrence? Um, you know, why keep building even more? And it the, the, the more they have, as well as particularly the ability to hit the continental United States with nuclear weapons, raises concerns in the minds of our Japanese and South Korean allies of, would you guys really trade San Francisco for Seoul? Uh, and we sort of had the same issue during the Cold War with NATO, and that's why the UK and France developed their own nuclear weapons programs. Uh, so we try to reassure them that, yes, we have a treaty, we have forces there, et cetera. But Allies are always a bit nervous when they have to rely on another nation for part of their security. 
So we have to reassure them that yes, even though they can hit our, our continent with nuclear weapons, we, we will be there in any kind of conflict. And that's part of how deterrence works is you have to instill a fear in the minds of your opponent that you will respond uh, to any kind of action, including nuclear weapons. So, uh, you know, it's, it's worrisome that they have these capabilities and we debate uh, why they have it. Some would say, oh, it's just deterrence. You know, I think it's to have capabilities, including sort of diplomatic, to intimidate or coerce South Korea and Japan. Sort of a nice place you got here. Shame if the Americans were to leave you. Uh, you know, maybe you want to give me what I want diplomatically. You know, why would you risk war over just this thing? Just give it to me. So it, it serves a number of objectives. Now, as we uh, end the show, I want to end on a, a, a final question that I think is one of those that uh, I think many people wonder, and that is unification of the Korean Peninsula. Do you see that as, as a, you know, a real option? And then how do you think it might actually occur, if you think it would occur at all? Well, you know, we, we've talked about this for, for decades. You know, on the one hand, it's not going to happen tomorrow. On the other hand, I can't imagine the Korea is still divided 100 years from now. So I'll take the bold prediction of sometime between one day and 100 years, it's going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it could be, uh, we hope a benign collapse and the regime, you know, says, look, you know, Kim Jong-un just died. We're, we're done with all this. Come on up and, you know, bring food, et cetera. Uh, or it could be the result of a, an invasion or even a stumbling into a nuclear war, et cetera. So we have to be prepared really for any number of, of actions. You know, in a way, unification is like, uh, you know, we're on one side of a, of a swamp. We don't like it. Uh, we would like a unified peninsula living under the principles that guide South Korea, freedom, democracy, free market principles, et cetera. Uh, we don't like being on this side of the swamp. On the other side of the swamp is a very happy, a sunny place, unified Korea, et cetera. But we don't want to get into the swamp to get to that other side because there's a lot of nasty things that could happen if we try to force a collapse or force a unification. So we're sort of stuck on this side, uh, hoping to prevent you know, North Korea from doing bad things and, and hoping over time, like with the collapse of East Europe and, and the Soviet Union, that it can happen peacefully. Now, we, we will continue trying diplomacy to achieve denuclearization. That may be a, a, a pipe dream diplomatically, but we, we don't want to give up, even though we've had a lot of failed agreements. Uh, but in the meantime, we need to maintain our deterrence. And, and that has both a defensive and an offensive component. We need to have very strong missile defenses, not only for the continental U.S., but for our allies, uh, both our systems and indigenous systems in Northeast Asia. And we also have to have the offensive component so that we reassure our allies and make clear to our opponents that we have the offensive abilities to take out their nuclear weapons, to, as some would say, to shoot the archer before he launches his, his, his arrows or, or, uh, or missiles. So it's both an offensive and defensive capability. We hope it's to deter North Korea from doing anything as it has. Uh, but if necessary, to defend and defeat that, that threat to not only the United States, but our allies. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank you, Bruce, uh, for coming on the show today. Of course, uh, Bruce Klingner specializes in Korean and Japanese affairs as the Senior Research Fellow for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Center. So with that, Bruce, I want to thank you again. And uh, we'll look forward to having you on in the future. Well, thank you, and, uh, and I look forward to it.